Welcome to the Mike and Allison After Hours Podcast with your host, Mike Sheila and Allison Haas, talking business with real business owners in the Mid-Atlantic region. Today's episode is sponsored by Advantage Industries. When you need business technology, get Advantage Industries to protect and promote your business. To learn more, go to www.getadvantage.com and schedule your first meeting to see if you qualify for a free network scan. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Mike and Allison After Hours. I am your host, Mike Sheila, and with me today is my always awesome and always on point co-host, Allison Haas. Allison, Happy New Year. Happy New Year. How the same does it feel, Mike? How the, how the same does it feel? <laughs> you, you got you turned into Yoda there for a second. For me. Just a second. Feeling well, are you? Mm. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so this is the first episode that we are recording in the new year. Uh, Allison and I had a little time off, but we had a couple episodes in the can, so that you, our listening audience, constantly were getting the good vibes and the good info and the good data. And today. We have an awesome guest, Kate Gerhart. She is a serial entrepreneur. She owns multiple companies. Uh, she's also a good, close, personal friend of Allison. And so, Allison, I want you to just take a couple minutes and talk about your good friend, Kate. And she'll be joining us a little bit later in the show today. I am so excited to talk to Kate this morning. Um, I love talking to you by yourself, Mike. But Kate is, and for the audience, I, I am a former horse trainer. I had my own business for eight years. And there are very few persons that I continue to speak with miss have any interest in from that world. And that is a blanket statement just because that's how I am, right? We know that by now. And Kate is one of those people that I absolutely respect, adore, and appreciate. And not only her entrepreneurial skill and just tenacity, but as a, a woman, things she's been through personally and physically, she is just resilient. When I think of resilience and persistency and just continuing to show up for life regardless of what it hands you, I think of Kate Gerhart. So I think she'll be a phenomenal example for us just from leadership and all aspects of humanness, right? In a time where that is so delicate and we continue to open up that can, I, I think she's a great, great victim, if you will. Yeah. So <laughs> and, yeah, and, and for our audience, we just had a little green room session with Kate beforehand because uh, wouldn't be our show if somebody wasn't having technical difficulties. <laughs> uh, so, but she's got a bright, sunny personality that I really think you, you as the audience, will find infectious. And yeah. speaking of our audience, uh, first of all, we cannot do this show without you. So, thank you so much. Whether you are watching us on YouTube, whether you are listening to us, and I, I want to run through this real quick. We are getting the word out to every possible platform. So we are on iTunes. We are on iHeartRadio. We are on Audible. We are on Spotify. We are on Stitcher. We are on Podbean. And we are now on Pandora as well. And Pandora was recently acquired by XM Satellite Radio, which means if you are an XM subscriber and you have the XM app, you can listen to us there as well. So we are, we're making ourselves as available as possible to the universe because we want as many people to not only listen to the show, but give us feedback on what will make it better. And so we have something a little fun this month. Uh, many of you know, Allison is an accomplished author. She published a fantastic book called The Addict in Isle 7. I loved it. I absolutely got a copy right after Allison told me she wrote it. And if you don't have your copy yet, Here's your chance to not only get a free copy, but to get oh. it personalized by Allison herself. This isn't working. So here's what I want There we go. There we go. Here's what I'm asking our lovely audience to do. I want you to like the show. I want you to comment on the show. Most importantly, I want you to post it on social media, whether that is LinkedIn, whether that is Facebook, whether that is Twitter, Instagram, whatever your social of choice is. And we are going to select one random winner, and we will announce that four weeks from today. So we'll give you a little time to get out there and really start helping us spread the word. 
And we're going to give a signed copy of the book away. Allison will mail it right to you. She'll put a big heart over the letter I and do it upright. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe if I like you enough. No, I, I'm so honored and flattered. Mike, you always think of me and I appreciate that. And to the audience, it's my personal story. Um, it is extremely raw, authentic. Couldn't get anything else from me. There are a few curse words. So if just your ears are um, sensitive, just prepare yourself or your eyes, but I, I am just like this show. We want to help people. My story, I just want to help people. So thank you in advance. And thank you, Mike. Yeah, it's, it's going to be awesome. Or if you just want to buy the book, go on Amazon Addict and, yeah, that's fine. and grab, grab your copy. Uh, and Allison too. will be certainly happy to personalize that for you as well. If you send it to her. Yep. So this week, we're going to put a little more focus on Allison's skill and background. As we often say, I'm an IT sales professional. Allison is an HR sales professional. And one of the traps I think a lot of small businesses fall into is they hear these terms and they have a perception of what they mean. They think that this means this. And 95% of the time, it's partially true at best. So I'm going to start with a very open question, Allison. What is Please. HR? Yeah, no, I love that. And I love the, the introduction because they are, they're buzzwords that make you cringe, right? You, th you hear HR Absolutely. and you're like, ah, no thanks, doesn't apply to me, or maybe later. So from my vantage point, HR's role is to protect the business, as simple as it can be. So you think of HR, you think of an administrative burden, you think maybe of a handbook, you think of job descriptions, which are true and, and important facets of HR. But HR, human resources, is really there to protect the business. And it could be a person internal to your organization with a hat that's HR director. It could be an outsourced person. There are tons of HR consultants out there that that do projects and one offs and, and give guidance. It could be a vendor. It could be an entity that does all those pieces as a bolt on to your business, um, a consolidation resource, maybe payroll with HR, with benefits, with technology. Um, but but first and foremost, it really is a protection, a, a layer to insulate you from anything employment related. Um, and we say all the time, Mike, it's not if something's going to happen, it's when. Yep. And I'll give a great example. So, again, a little peek behind the curtain. Uh, Allison's company is a vendor for Mine Advantage Industries. And we brought a new employee on at the first of the year. And that was our first opportunity to go through the HR onboarding process with her firm. So if you think about that, when you hire a person, there's a lot that goes into that process. It's, you know, it's salary, it's dependence, it's insurance, it's medical benefits. It's, I mean, tell us, Allison, the, the list goes on and on. I mean, I got, I got the things people probably think of, but what are the, all the other, some of the other things, not all, but some of the other things people yeah. don't think of. Well, I think what you don't think of is the soft touch, right? What is the first impression you're making through the interviewing process? that someone gets into your organization, right? Because you are your business card, right? You, your personality, how you portray, what mm -hmm. you say during the interview process, right? So we go to processes and policies. Uh, you think of, even if it's not a candidate that you intend on hiring, are you leaving them with a good taste in their mouth? And and are they a referral source now for your organization? So the, the first part of, attracting a candidate, the recruitment process is as important as what happens once you find someone, right? So that onboarding process begins before you even say yes and offer with a letter documentation, right? So the legalities and complexities around compliance as far as what's documented, what you say in an offer letter, what you offer, what you're bound to in that letter, right? Um, and it doesn't matter if you have three employees or 300. You are bound, unfortunately, by the same rules. ACA comes in at 50. But besides that, like you are expected to do a certain a, a number of things. And in fairness to your employees and in wanting to put your best face forward, you should be doing 
different things from a documentation standpoint. So it, it's it's how how are you presenting yourself? And then once they are onboarded with a payroll vendor, healthcare, a compensation package, which includes perhaps a 401k training and development opportunities, right? Growth opportunities. Is there a trajectory for growth for an employee? Why do they want to come to you as a small organization in Howard County versus, you know, a Fortune 500 organization where they're one of, right? What's the differentiator there? And so we believe not only in protecting the business, but helping you be competitive with the big guys because the little guys are just as important. You might not have the resources though to offer those things. So getting a, a, a guide to help you understand where you need to be from a competitive advantage amongst your competitors that are bigger and smaller is really important too. And I love where you started that with the idea of a soft touch because it, it, it immediately made me think back in 1999 when I got my first technology sales job, I remember my first morning in the office. We were at 7 St. Paul Street, Baltimore, Maryland. We were on the 10th floor. And I walked in, my cubicle was already set up, and there was a box of my business cards with my name on it, my first yes. desk, just yes. sitting there waiting for me. And I can tell you, that has not been the experience <laughs> at most companies that I've worked for. I, I remember I had one job about 10 years ago where I walked in, and my new manager looked at me and said, oh, I forgot you were starting today. Oh, jeez. And he had nothing prepared for me. Wow. So I sat around with the proverbial thumb up the proverbial. Yep. And did a whole lot of nothing that day. Yep. So you're, so HR can give you the blueprint to effectively onboarding new employees and making them feel welcome, making them feel home. Yes. yes. And you felt important, right? You feel valued. You feel like you're going to matter, right? And I had the same experience at my current op opportunity where my first day, things were set up for me. I had a computer, I had cards, I had a, a, a guide, right? And, and I was able to get onto a technology platform, which it's 2021, technology matters, modernization matters, it's streamlining processes matter. So I, I get online, I'm enrolled in everything I need to be. I see what I need to do from a box checking standpoint with compliance, uh, sexual harassment training, things like that. Um, that important? Way, <laughs> yes. By the way, just a little, right? Just business a little. owners, you need to be doing those things with your employees and with yourself. Um, but but I felt like I mattered, and I felt like this organization had it together. So not only was I probably going to get paid what they told me, but I was going to get paid when they told me I would get paid, and I just felt like they had it together, right? And so you know, having an HR expert in your life or a vendor with with people attached to it to give you guidance just makes your employees and then they want to work harder, right? So you feel like you matter, which then yields a, a greater level of engagement, which then goes directly to your bottom line. When an employee feels valued, they want to work harder for you, for themselves, which only helps you. Yeah, and our listening audience knows Allison and I are book nerds. And I, I texted Allison last night a picture of, of a book that I got for Christmas from my wife. Uh, thanks to the delightful shipping system that we've had uh, over these holidays, I got my last Christmas present on <laughs> January 5th. Um, it's I, a I gift that keeps on giving. It's perfect. Yeah, it, it, was, it was more like Hanukkah because I got, I got a new gift yeah. like every two or three days because yeah. of that. But I, the book is called Ego versus EQ. And uh, Allison and I have talked about this. I, I'm a big fan of the concept of emo emotional intelligence. You know, the first book I ever read was The Other Kind of Smart. And the EQ part really does play in to why HR is so important. I, I think small business owners, you know, God, God bless you, I, I, I know what it takes to run a business and I don't know how to run one successfully, but I, I know that there's a lot that goes into running a business and having employees. Um, and I think you did a great job of saying this already, but I want to circle back to you know, from your perspective, why is HR so important for any business, whether you have one employee or a thousand? Yeah. And what you're bringing to mind back to the protecting yourself and 
tying in EQ, I, I live with a business owner and he didn't go to school to be a business owner, right? He went to school to practice dentistry and, yep. and that's an art and a skill. And as he's evolved in his career, owning a practice became part of the next step for him and part of his vision. So he executed, God bless him, just before COVID. Um, and so this year has been his first year of being a business owner. And we are constantly talking about having your emotions involved and doing the next thing from a compliance perspective and what is required from a due diligence to protect your business perspective. And as a human being feeling bad for having to make certain decisions that directly impact people, but are best for the business. And so because I'm unemotion, I'm and I have an advantage because I'm not emotionally involved in the business, right? I'm not directly tied to these people. I'm not in their day to day. I'm not interacting. So it's easy for me as an outside consultant, if you will, to tell mm -hmm. him what the next thing to do is that is right for the business. And I think that is key when it comes to HR. You have to have guidance that is unbiased, unemotional, detached that can help you protect your business. And not saying that we give guidance that's unfair. In fact, we actually, we will be, we as an HR organization will be more fair in the employee's favor because at the end of the day, the employee usually wins and we're trying to protect you. But that means, are you documenting things? How are you saying things? Are you giving people next steps, right? Um, even if the end result is the same, say it's going to end in termination, there are steps to take between your decision and that yep. execution. And having someone able to guide you in that process and what that looks like. Again, so soft touches, what their first impression matters, their last impression matters as much, if not more, right? How do you end things with an employee? How did you treat them during those final stages, if you will, where it's just not the right fit? It happens all the time that you have a job description. They are not adhering to that description. They're not producing. They're not able to do it. It's not a fit for whatever reason. So how do you treat them and what is the exit process through that? It's just as important as the entry. And, you know, Mike and I are dealing with that for him right now. And it's hard, right? Because he feels bad. You know, he feels bad as a person. And yet he is not able to work on people's mouths because he's constantly checking other things that are errors administratively, right? And that's not producing money for the business. So protect the business, but give you your time back in your business to grow it and make money, right? You shouldn't have to be doing these little things to button up your business from a compliance perspective and HR perspective, but you have to. So I think getting time back to, to actually do what you want to do, which is work and be a business owner and a leader and, and excel there uh, while also making sure you're, you're doing the things administratively that you need to be doing. Yeah, and you just touched on something that's frankly, it's at the core of your business as the as well as mine is so many small businesses fail because whatever leadership is in place, whether it's that single shingle person or whether it's a small group of people, they try to do everything themselves mm -hmm. instead of outsourcing. And I, I've talked about this many of times. Hiring my company particularly for a small business, is way less expensive than it is to hire an IT person. And same thing for, for your program. You know, hiring your organization is way less money than it is to hire one HR professional. Yes. And you're getting the benefit of a wide berth of expertise over a number of industries. So if there's one thing I can encourage our listening audience today is, Seriously explore vendors for things that you shouldn't be doing yeah. <laughs> that are outside of your core business skill set. Right. Um, so with that, I, I, I mentioned this book a couple episodes ago, The One Thing. And I, I love that book because it gives you this. If I take care of this one thing today. Mm -hmm. Most of my other problems tend to go away because I took care of the one thing. And what shocks me as an IT sales professional is how many small businesses I walk into and they don't have a firewall. Mm. Like that's the one thing that's not a really significant investment that uh, any business owner, you can order one on, e on Amazon. You can order a firewall on Amazon. 
It doesn't cost a lot of money and it goes a very long way to protecting your business. So Allison, I know you've been doing your job now for almost four years. You've met with hundreds of companies. Yes. What What's the one thing that you see that you're always like, I can't believe they're not doing this. It's so simple and it's so easy. Why aren't they doing this? Yeah, I, I think the, the streamlining of processes, right? If I, if I had, I, I wanted to initially say payroll with HR support, but but then what is that? And and it's a streamlining of processes, a consolidation of processes, ideally off of paper, right? And I know there are people that are old school. I'm half of one of them. I still write everything in a day planner. I love to take notes. I'm doing it right now while we're talking, pen on paper. Um, I know it might be more efficient to put everything on electronically. I do both, right? So I do appreciate the person that loves their paper process, but it's slow. You can't keep track of it. God forbid your building burns down or you lose it or the dog eats it or whatever, right? So streamlining of process and, and consolidation of resources from an HR perspective, um, which ties in the IT piece, you know, it's it just will make your life easier. And being willing to, I'm kind of answering you, Mike, so I apologize, but we know how this goes. <laughs> you know, being willing to invest a little bit of dollars into removing this burden from your plate so you can work and or not work, right? Like, are you are you building an, a, a business for you, for your kids? You want time with your kids? You want to be able to take them to if there are even recitals anymore because of COVID? I don't know. But, you know, like I'm thinking of one of my soon to be clients right now, and he he's in business because he wants to take his kids to ballet, right? Not because he wants to be a billionaire. And I think, great, like we can help you do that. Let us help you stop working on the things that are preventing you from being available at dinner time. you know? Yeah, that that that's that's awesome because I, I don't think that a lot of small business owners think of it in that perspective. And you you brought up a subject a few moments ago about minimizing loss and minimizing risk. I was I was on a conference call with a co- with several colleagues earlier this week, and one of my colleagues, uh, she's a salesperson for a marketing company. They have sixty employees. And they lost all of their data to a ransomware attack. Oh, jeez. Oh, my God. All of it. So they spent the last two weeks trying to reconstruct all of their data. Wow. Because they didn't have a backup in place. And again, wow. backups are not expensive. Not compared to having to replace all of your data. Right. And Wow. So, again, I'm, I'm always fascinated by the synergies between our two industries. Yep. Because on the one hand, you could argue that we do the same thing. <laughs> but it's not an either or. It's an and both. You, you really – and there are, there are other aspects that you need to do to run a business. I'm, I'm certainly not blind to that or ignorant of that. Uh, we are not the be all and end all. It's not like you hire Mike, you hire Allison, and hmm, smooth sailing. No, <laughs> but <laughs> we're two, we're two pretty big chunks of the puzzle, yeah. as far as fundamentals, as far as establishing your business. And so, thank you for running through why HR is critical, even to a small business, and and that's you know particularly in this COVID pandemic that we're dealing with. Mm-hmm. Money truly is a premium. Cash flow is truly a premium. Um, you know, Hopefully people are starting to get their stimulus checks. And so that's making people breathe a sigh of relief, at least momentarily. And you know, as, as the vaccinations are handed out at a re- more mm-hmm. and more rapid pace, you know, we can see a positive light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. Any other HR thoughts that you want to pepper the audience with before Kate joins us in a couple of minutes? I think people are often wondering when is the time to Uh outsource HR with a vendor or a consultant or to hire someone. And I think start doing your research immediately, right? And before stuff hits the fan. Right. It's 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 everyone has growth initiatives. 
whether it's adding bodies to your organization to help you, you know, grow revenue or just revenue or expand into multiple or places or to be acquired or merged or whatever. And the more you have in a row from an HR perspective, the greater your chance of being able to sell your business at the top value, attract more employees to it, be acquired by another organization, and the, the, the greater your chances for success are sooner. So my, my encouragement is to always act on that earlier, right? Not after you have 50 employees or you <laughs> hit ACA guidelines or when healthcare renewals are so volatile, you just can't keep up or for you know, you can't afford to keep up with healthcare because that's a huge part of compensation for employees. You know, do it before you think you need it so that, you know, it's again, it's not if it's it's when. So do it before you think you need it so that you're you're more aptly prepared to execute when things start to go wrong. My uh my my very first sales job, I think I've mentioned this before, is I sold insurance door to door. And one of the objection handlers they taught us was it's better to have it and not need it than to need it and not have it, especially at such Amen. a low price. Isn't that true? Yes. Yes. I love that. And but, it is true. Yep. Allison, you know what time Hi. it is? That's awesome. Here Kate we go. Kate is here. Let's welcome Kate to the show. Kate Gerhardt. Welcome to Mike and Allison After Hours. We are super happy to have you on the show. Hey, hey girl. how are you doing? Wonderful, Good. wonderful, wonderful. Uh, we told everybody we had a little green room fun with you before the show, trying to solve the technical difficulties. Uh, but true to our form, we're going to grit our teeth and we're going to just bear through it. So, Kate, there are two segments to the show. Uh, who, what, where, when, why, how. Okay. And then we're going to talk about some things around leadership, around your businesses, around your industry. And I'm going to go through the first segment, the who, what part, and then Allison's going to finish us off going through the leadership and the businesses. But you know, we started the show off, Kate, by describing you as a serial entrepreneur <laughs> with multiple businesses. Yes. And yes. I, I thought that was a fairly succinct way to describe you. But let's start with the who. Who is Kate Gerhardt? So, as Allison knows me from the past, um, I'm an equestrian, so I've come up through the industry um, the most natural way possible. Uh, my mother's father was a horse dealer, so they would go and they would go to New Holland sales on Monday. They would oh my gosh, was... New Holland right go back. <laughs> I remember catching a piglet once in the mud, but anyway, I digress. It was fun. It's an old auction site. It is. It is. And, and they would purchase whatever they thought was uh, a quick and easy turnaround. And my poor mother would be subject to the torture of getting it fixed up and ready to go. And they would flip it the next Monday and on and on it went. And uh, you know, my mother did not want to subject me to that. So we've done that a little bit more high class over the years. <laughs> um, I've been very fortunate to have some fantastic horses, um, mm -hmm. to have some really dedicated, committed, um, loyal clients who understand that things take time. And that's kind of gotten me to where I am in the horse industry today. Um, everything else has been sort of a, a sidetrack with downtime <laughs> that I've had based on the, the number of times that I've gotten hurt. So there were a couple concussions wow. along the way. So I, I think namely, you know, I think the 12th was the worst. Um, and I got to meet everybody down at Jefferson concussion and they brought in a couple Eagles players and a couple flyers players. And they told me, you know, it's really not worth it. You shouldn't keep doing it. And I was like, well, you know, you get busy living or you get busy dying. Mm. So I'm never going to leave this, this whole horse world. It's a part of me. It keeps me going. It's just, you know, it's, it's kind of like that burning fire that you have in your soul. But in the meantime, I've got Equibooks, which is the nerd side of me. That's the... Uh, the we love nerds. Well, <laughs> I love nerds too. <laughs> um, so I'm a pro advisor. And I've sort of taken that into the horse industry because 
at the end of the day, everybody's been riding and training and teaching and doing all that, but they have to be able to collect their bills and they have to be able to manage that and know what they should be charging, what they shouldn't mm -hmm. be charging. They have to be able to make money. Um, yeah. This is, it is a recreation, but it is a business. So yeah. there's Equibooks. And then back when I was getting into uh, the Rita's franchise, I hated the idea of paying rent. Like it's a seasonal business. So you're open eight, nine months a year. And then what you sit idle and you pay rent to somebody for the four months that you're closed. It just didn't make sense to me. So got into the Rita's. I'm loving that. I love the, the interpersonal dynamics of that and seeing people every day and knowing what they order. It's, it's kind of like being a bartender, except for <laughs> sober people. <laughs> uh, except for but, sugar. Right? Yeah, yeah, there's like green apple guy, mango gelati girl. and But the good news is that I also have um, a couple, you know, I had a condo, I had a couple different locations that I've sold over the years, but right now the primary um, part of Underwood Holdings is the business that houses Rita's. So there's a couple apartments in there and that keeps the mortgage. Oh, interesting. So that I don't have to worry about it when the store is closed. So I'm not in Brilliant. panic mode in the winter. So that's Underwood Holdings. That's got probably four tenants right now. And, you know, we're looking to expand, get a couple more buildings, get a couple more tenants and uh, be the best landlord ever. <laughs> <laughs> and so we did the who, we did a little bit of the what. Uh, tell you're, you're in the Philly proper area just outside of Philly. Is yep. It, and when it comes to clients, where, where are you servicing? Obviously, Rita's is, you know, like a 10-mile radius. But, you know, sure. for all your other businesses, where, where do you serve? So our, the equine end of things, I am as far south as Philly and as far east as Jersey City and as far west as Reading. Okay. And as far north as Allentown. So that big old bubble right there is where so all So the expanded are. Philadelphia market. Correct. Yes. All right. Gotcha. And when did this start? I mean, I, I'm getting the vibe that you've always been in business for yourself, that you've maybe when you were a teenager, you did this, but you've never traditionally punched a clock or worked for someone else. So wh when did this start? Did you always know you were going to be an entrepreneur? Or? Pretty much. Yeah. Um, it's a family thing. <laughs> okay. Um, so my mother's always done her own thing here at the farm and that's uh, Northridge Farms based out of Sellersville. So I was a partner in Northridge Farms for a long time and it just made more sense for me to be a separate entity just for tax purposes. And again, that's the nerd side of me, <laughs> but we work alongside each other um, very synergistically. And, you know, for me being 35 and her, I believe she's turning 67, to have coexisted in a working mother-daughter relationship for this mm. amount of time, I think we have a pretty good thing. <laughs> um, but she still likes to have her own thing. And my dad passed away about, I think it was 12 years ago now. Um, and he had a mechanical contracting business that he was partners in with his brother. So, oh, and then there's my brothers. <laughs> so after my dad passed and they were working for him, they both went their separate ways and they were entrepreneurial and where they wanted to go with their lives. So I don't think so it's in your blood. Have, yeah. None of us have punched a time clock and not that we don't want to answer to anybody, but we don't want to have somebody else in charge of our destiny. Wow. That's very cool. So let me ask you, since you own a Rita's franchise, I, it, I've heard a thousand ads on the radio to buy a franchise and be your own man and do this and do that. Uh, and I know it's not nearly as simple as the commercials portray it. So I'm, I'm guessing it's not necessarily harder or easier than starting a business. 
but it's different. So talk to us about the differences of owning a franchise as opposed to owning a business. Good, bad, ugly, everything in between. Okay. So I've always been in service industries. Horses are very much a service industry. Uh, the horses are like their own entity, and then there's their people. And oh, yeah. You have to manage both of them, and sometimes you have to manage both of them separately. Um, so I feel like in a lot of ways, that's like dealing with franchise. And when we first opened Rita's in Quakertown, I did get some pushback because we're right up the street from a mom pa, and people said, oh, well, franchise really isn't small business. And I think that's my biggest beef with franchise is the public understanding of it. Mm. That they don't, the general public doesn't understand that franchise is one person that's coming in in the morning and they're busting their hump and they probably have another job. And, you know, they have a very small, cohesive group of employees and it is a family and it's not corporate. Corporate is corporate. Corporate's up top. And I could never say a bad thing about uh, Rita's Franchise Corporation. I have a fantastic relationship with corporate. And I don't think that starting off in the food industry, I would have wanted to do it any other way <laughs> because I never did it before. That's not saying that I don't have other ideas for other things I'd like to do in the future. Um, that won't be franchised, but with being in service, that doesn't mean that you know how to run a food establishment. Right. <laughs> so you get right. the support that you need coming up the curve for doing something different, even though you've already managed businesses before. Um, but they're not, they're really not as bad as everybody portrays them to be. I love corporate. Uh, the CEO came into my store at the height of the pandemic and she was probably one of the most. Wow genuine flattering supportive people i could have ever met and she popped in there and she's like i love your store i love what you do sent me a nice little wall clock two weeks later which made me cry like <laughs> you know um if somebody is looking for something different to do i would definitely recommend that that's a direction they go if they don't have experience in that area uh, I would just say that if you're going to go that direction, just make sure you have the ability to manage your own business and your interpersonal relationships with your staff. Beyond that, the support is definitely, it's well worth it. How many employees do you have, Kate? We're small. Um, right now, we're seven. Now, is that still a bunch of people. Is that the Underwood? <laughs> That's just uh, that's just the Underwood Food Services that sort of hovers over my Rita's franchise. Um, I toyed with the idea of expand of expanding to different locations, and everybody on the team is on board with that. They'd like to mix it up a little bit, go into a different store now and again, see some different people. Um, but yeah, for right now, we're at seven and. I hired one additional and I'm toying with the idea of hiring one more for the summer, but we're, we're like a little family. And that's so, part-time seasonal, right? For the most part. Yeah. All the girls are under 40 hours and yeah, my girls are amazing. Some of them they're working two jobs in the winter. They're working two other jobs so that they can stay on board. I just sent the text out to all of them last night. You know who's coming back for this year, and and they're all coming back. That's so great. They really only have three months of downtime over the winter. We stay open till beginning mid November, and then we're open again in February. Mm -hmm. So you're getting ready to ramp back up. Yeah, I don't know where the time went. <laughs> <laughs> now, do you close? <laughs> do you close because is that a Rita's thing, or is that because people don't want Rita's for those couple months, which I find hard to believe. They do want Rita's for those couple months, but as you know, horses are seasonal as well, unless you have yeah. a month to ship the whole kit and caboodle to Florida. Yep. So it's nice for me to be able to join the holidays. Um, mm. I take the holidays and I take family time very seriously. Mm -hmm. So if I had to be open on Thanksgiving Eve, hours on Christmas Eve, that sort of thing, it just doesn't appeal to me. Yeah. 
If yeah, I'm, good for you. I'm like ramped up in the summer and the spring with the horses. I'm ramped up in the summer and the spring with Rita's. And if I'm going to work double time for nine months a year, I, I just kind of want those three months to chill out. Yep. Um, it's kind of like an athlete. You have the off season. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And we've kept in touch with the community. We're doing first Saturdays, which is a downtown small business event. So we've been open one day a month for catering orders only. So people stock up on courts and they come in and they, you still get to, you know, how was your Christmas? How was your New Year's? That sort of thing. You keep your relationships going with your customers and you still maintain that first name basis, but you're not maintaining that, you know, being there from two to nine every single day not being able to be at home so right for now right. it's a model that just works for us yep. so kate if people want to contact you certainly if they want readers go to your readers in quakerstown that's that's the easy answer but mm -hmm. for the other elements uh the, for the underwood component uh for the equestrian piece wh what are the best ways to contact you i'm very easy to reach on social I think all the business pages um, operate as they should, so you can reach out and send a message. Um, I also, I probably spend way too much time on my phone. <laughs> so, um, text messages are always the best way to go. Uh, that way, if I'm teaching or if I'm on a horse, that sort of thing, I don't have to be able to answer the phone all the time if somebody calls. Uh, usually, email works too. Um, I try to be as responsive as I can, but like, for example, the Rita's page, people want to message me in the off season and say, Hey, I was just wondering if we could get X, Y, and Z, or if we can get a cake for somebody's birthday. Um, that message component on social is, it's fantastic. Anybody can reach you at any time. You can respond to them at any time of the day. It's very, it's still personal, it's dynamic and it works. Um, so yeah, via Facebook. Um, short of putting my cell phone out there on YouTube. <laughs> you can get I was just going to say, phone. if you want, we'll put your email and your phone number <laughs> in the show notes. Just let us know after the show what you want out there publicly. Sure. And we'll make sure it's in the show notes for all the episodes. No, I appreciate that. That'd be awesome. All right. Great. Well, Allison? Yeah. Take and it. I, um, I mean, I'm going to shock Mike here, but I kind of want to steer this a little differently. Yeah, And I, I introduced you as one of the few that I've even wanted to keep in touch with from my former <laughs> horse life. And Ditto. I think the audience may be like, what the hell? Horses is not, isn't a business. It's not a sport, you know, all the things. And I'd love to talk a little bit about that because as, as you know, uh, I did lose my fire for that, for riding, yeah. for the horses, for the whole thing, right? I totally burn out. There isn't a horse picture in here anymore. It took me a while to take them down, but you know, that's not part of how I live anymore. But I really want to talk about whatever you're comfortable sharing, of course, you know, the, what it took to get back on your feet, literally, like, I mean, you mentioned Jefferson, but you really went through it. And I know I was one of the people that was like, don't you dare get back on a horse, right? Like, don't yeah, do you, it. You and tried. <laughs> I did try. And I also know I can't control you or anyone. And, you know, I personally have also had my my list of concussions. I've had eight and three serious ones. And But I wasn't, you know, incapacitated to the extent that you were. So I would love for you to share with us a little bit about that process because you don't sound like somebody that gives up easily. And I think that's important to also know that that even though you didn't, there are elements of wanting to. So whatever you're comfortable sharing about that. Sure. So, I mean, horses is a school of hard knocks and we love it. And like you said, the, the fire is what keeps you going and it's, it's in there and it takes a lot for it to go away. But getting hurt every single time it happens, it brings everything into perspective. And then mm -hmm. you're sort of at a crossroads and you say, is this worth it? Nope. And every time I've been at that crossroads and I've said, you know what? It is worth it because I wouldn't be who I am if it wasn't for everything that led up to that. It doesn't necessarily mean, though, that I have to identify as that. Mm -hmm. And. I think that's something we all bump into when 
we do mature and we're like, okay, this is our life and yeah. this is what we do. This is our vocation, but who am I? Yeah. And maybe that sort of a uh, late twenties, early thirties, depending how long you've been in the industry that you're in for me, that was early twenties. Um, and you start to realize that even though you do not punch a time clock, you still are owned by someone at some point in time. <laughs> Somebody yeah. else is still signing your paycheck in some way, shape, or form. And you just have to be sure that you have everything lined up the way you want it so that you're comfortable with the lifestyle that you have. Yeah. Um, nobody is completely independent and runs their own show entirely. Uh, I love that. I love, and I think that's huge for our audience listening, you know, like who, who are you besides the owner of XYZ corporation? Right. Who are you besides, you know, the, 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 the sport you pursue, if it is your business or the hobbies you pursue and that you then turn into your business. And I think that is, really important. And I know for me, right, I, I could no longer identify as an equestrian, right? The people writing my paychecks had had robbed me and not one particular person, but just the, the exhausted hustle of it daily mm -hmm. took away my want to do it anymore. And right. I wanted to have a further reach than I was having. So I think yeah. that's huge for people to listen to and also to give it time, right? I didn't yes. arrive at that conclusion in one day or one no. year. It took time um of getting knocked down and around to really arrive at a place where like you know what my heart is not invested in this anymore yeah. and i'm not making a fortune so let's see where <laughs> else we can we can push this so thank you for that and i i really i would love you know to hear a little bit more about your injury and and what got you through it and then on to the other side to then continuing on your feet literally forward with your life so there were the concussions, um, you know, a, a, f a number of them, a fair number of them. <laughs> yes. um, Jefferson Concussion Center is absolutely wonderful. They do understand what it's like to be an athlete. And like I said, I, I got to talk to some Eagles players. I got to talk to some Flyers players and they were like, yeah, you know, it's not really worth it. And the way I look at it is the way I used to look at it when I was a gymnast. And they had me slated to be pre-Olympic. And I said, you know what? This isn't a lifetime sport. So I'm not going to go whole hog with this because when I'm done, I'm done. Yeah. And the equestrian sport is very different. Even if you're not in the saddle every single day, there is still something that you have to offer in the long mm. run. You get to just stand in that middle of the indoor ring for you know, however many hours a day you want to, and you get to share what you've learned over the years with people who share the same passion that you do. Yep. So I wanted to keep going with it for sure. Um, and I took the time away from the sport that I needed to in order to get healthy again. And I missed it. And I always left the door open and I said, you know, if I don't miss it, I'm not going to go back. Yep. And I missed it. So I went back and yep. my, my head got good. And then my back took a dive. So there I am a couple of years later and I'm looking at a L5 S1 anterior posterior lumbar discectomy infusion. And I'm like, holy cow, I'm not even, I'm just, just hit my thirties. And is this the direction that this is going to go? And surgery went well, but then my nerves started to heal and you know, the neuropathy was terrible. So I ended up in a wheelchair and they said, we don't know if this is ever going to get any better. So I couldn't even walk myself around a horse show to coach my kids and it got better and you get out of the wheelchair and you get back on the horse and you get back in the horse show ring and you just, you keep going. And every time I've been down, I said, you know what, it's probably a good idea for me to find something else to do just in case this doesn't yep. work. Yep. And that's where all the little stuff has come in. And I say little stuff, but honestly, <laughs> it's what makes it that, um, I don't have to, not that I don't have to answer, but I don't have to rely on my physical capacity signing my horseback riding paycheck. Yeah. I can enjoy the sport. I can make choices. I can say that one's crazy. I'm not doing that. No. <laughs> I can say, I don't want to go to a horse show for five weeks straight. I can, 
I can make it work. And there's been a lot of sort of heartache and pain to get to that point, but I'm really happy. That's where I'm at now. And there's, there's balance. So even when it's peak horse show season and peak Rita season, and you're getting up at whatever time in the morning and you're riding six before you go into the store and then you're at the store until nine o'clock at night and you somehow find time for family and cooking dinners and lunches and that sort of thing in between. There's balance because there's change throughout the course of the day. There's all kinds of different happy, smiling people. And it's, it's what I sort of engineered. It's what I want and it's very healthy. And I'd like to keep it that way. I don't envy you in listening to your your version of balance. And I think <laughs> but I also think, you know, you're, you're smart too. And I think the key piece is is you said you've made choices, right? That work for you. And I think that's key in, in being an entrepreneur and a business leader and owner or anybody that manages their own entity or people, um, the ability to make choices. And I think when you lose the ability to make a choice is when you have to reevaluate where you are and where you're headed. And um, I, I commend you for that. And I just, I have to say, you are, I'm thinking back to so many memories of watching you ride and, and just looking up to you and you're such a badass, right? And I, I didn't know about the gymnast thing and I'm not surprised at all. And I just remember the time that you were down and that you never lost hope. And I think, you know, having a mom now in a wheelchair for me and having broken my leg last year and been off my feet for, a, a you know, a, a meager eight weeks, which is a long time, but also yeah. not right in the scheme of life, but it gives you perspective. It really does. And, you know, the poo poo blues that I've been having lately, cause I'm just sick of COVID. Um, <laughs> yep. You know, and it, it's just like, you know, being reminded this morning with you, you know, like you take your hard knocks, but you take them in stride and it helps give you perspective and gratitude for what you are able to do and then and the choices you're able to make. So thank you for that. Um, Mike, anything to add? I know I I went somewhere else, but, you know, whatever. It's fine. No, I, <laughs> I, I, I love the, the, the path that you took because I think you and Kate touched on a lot of leadership things, you know, for our audience, this show is about entertainment as well as education. And I think we got healthy doses of that. And I think this is our 10th episode or 11th episode that we're recording. Yes. And every, every business leader we've spoken to, it certainly had commonalities, but they're all unique. And if this is a word, you're the you're the most you're the most uniquest <laughs> that we've had as far as the diversity and the way you've come up. And I, I got a concussion about nine years ago, uh, and I'm I'm dealing with some of it right now. Actually, it's come back and reared its ugly head. I'm going to see my doctor in a couple of weeks, and I haven't had to deal with it for the better part of the last nine years. So I, I sympathize with what that pain feels like. And to, you know, run multiple businesses. And Allison said it, and I'll say it too, you've made choices. And as a business leader, making choices is some of the hardest stuff. Um, so with that, Kate, I will say... Thank you so much for being a guest on our show. And to our audience, again, remember, we're giving away a copy of Allison's book, The Addict in Aisle 7. All you have to do to win your copy is help us get the word out. We are on Pandora. We are on Audible. We are on Spotify. We are on iTunes. We are on Stitcher. We are on TuneIn. We are on Podbean. You can watch the show on YouTube. So if you go out on your social medias, your LinkedIn, your Facebook, your Twitter, your Instagram, share a link to our show. Write a review for our show on one of those platforms. Give it a like. Drop a comment. All of those things help amplify our opportunity for other people to hear the show. And one of you lucky folks is going to get a copy of Allison's book, The Addict in Isle 7, next month. And we will announce that in February. So for Kate Gerhardt, 
uh, for Allison Haas. I am Mike Sheila. This is Mike and Allison After Hours. And remember, folks, people helping people, it is powerful stuff. Thank you for joining Mike and Allison After Hours. Tune in next time for another great business owner sharing valuable industry ideas. Want to be a guest on our show? Contact us at answers at getadvantage.com.